Do you have knee pain with stairs, squats, or walking? Well, here is what might be going on and what you can do about it. Pain located right here is commonly due to patellar tendinopathy, which you may know as jumper's knee. Typically, we see this in highly active younger people like basketball players, though it can show up in really anyone. Pain happens with anything which increases the strain and load on the patellar tendon. This is the tendon which connects the kneecap down to the lower leg or the shin bone. Activities which stress the tendon include anything where we significantly bend the knee or put high loads on the joint. So think squats, going down the stairs, etc. Why does this happen? It is complex and varies a little bit by the person. Historically, tendon disorders were thought to be due to inflammation, which is why you're probably familiar with the term tendonitis. The itis ending refers to inflammation. These days we call it a tendinopathy because we have come to learn the core issue actually has to do with tendon degeneration, essentially tendon weakening, and not due to inflammation. Why does this degeneration happen? Well, other health conditions like smoking, obesity, diabetes, etc., make us more susceptible. But the biggest factor is our activity level leading to overload of the tendon. We can broadly separate people into three buckets. First is the person who did too much to soon, so a person increased their activity level faster than the body could adapt to it. Examples include a runner who went from running 2 miles a day to running 10, or the out-of-season athlete who just started back to season again, or the person who was normally sedentary but just now started running or working out. The second bucket is the person who chronically does too much and does not give their body or tendon a break to fully recover. For example, a high-volume distance runner who never never takes a day off for months or years. And the third bucket is the sedentary or inactive person. This one is harder for people to understand. The simplest way to make sense of it is just to realize that use it or lose it applies to nearly everything with the human body. As we age, naturally our body falls on the lose it side of the equation. If we remain physically active, we slow down how quickly our tendons lose the ability to tolerate load. But if we are inactive, that decline happens faster because we are not challenging the body to hold on to that ability. If we remain sedentary, eventually we reach a point where the tendon has lost the ability to tolerate tolerate loads it previously could. Early on, that is high level activities like running or jumping, over enough time it also comes to include lower level activities like walking. This is why we can develop the condition and pain with even seemingly basic tasks and activities. Now your next question is likely how long will it take to get better? We do have data on this, but my answer also depends how exactly you define better. Is better that you can go through your daily life without limitations? Is it never experiencing pain again? Or is it getting back 100% to a collegiate sport? Because our answer differs by which metric you use. That data I mentioned tells us most get better without surgery. But better in this study meant that the adult returned to their daily life and leisure without limitation. When it came to athletics, the findings were more mixed. Those with mild cases return to their sport in about 20 days. However, those with severe cases were closer to 90 days or three months. Another study found less than half were able to return to a competitive sport at six months after symptom onset. And another found people may continue to have mild to moderate pain with athletics even 15 years after symptoms began. So we can say we'll probably get to where our pain does not limit us in our daily life, but it may limit our ability to compete in sport. As for how quickly recovery happens, it varies because it also depends on your overall health, age, severity, etc. But the research tells us you should expect recovery to take months 
not days, not weeks, but many months, even up to about one year. Your symptoms will not stay as bad as they currently are for that whole time though. Research shows the majority of improvement happens within the first three to six months. Past that, you'll often still have some lingering symptoms for the following six to nine months. How this may look is that at month four, you've returned back to working out, your job, etc., without a major limitation. But you may still have an ache at the end of the day. What we should expect in the following months is that we will continue to improve. However, improvement will be slower and more incremental. You may not even easily notice that you're improving because it's so slow. You may only realize that change at month number nine when you are back to your one rep max at the gym or you no longer have that ache at the end of the workday. Takeaway is your recovery will probably take longer than you expect. Now, what are our treatment options? We have several, including physical therapy, medications, non-surgical management like injections, and potentially even surgery. Let's go ahead and talk through each. First are the exercises. This is the primary and the best treatment for patellar tendinopathy. The core underpinning idea is that our pain arises because what our tendon can currently take is at this level, whereas the demands we are currently placing on it is at this level. That is why here initially we want to pull back on our overall activity volume and intensity to try and pull it back down below this level, at least initially while we start to recuperate. Physical therapy exercises focus on building up what that tendon can take so that we can get it up to this level, where the tendon is able to tolerate more load than what our daily life places upon it. At that point, we should be able to return to our prior activities with less or no pain. Pain. How do we accomplish that? There are a ton of options. Here is what I think is the simplest way for most people to go about it. We'll talk through these from easiest to the hardest exercise. These two exercises are our starting point. This is where we would begin if we have a really high level of pain because we can easily modify the difficulty of the exercise to get it to a tolerable level of discomfort. On the left, you push out as hard as you can against a stable object like a belt before your pain hits a three out of 10. You hold it for the set amount of time, relax, and then repeat. On the right is a squat where we use our hands for assistance. We can do this either with a towel looped overhead on a door frame slash rack or using our hands on a stable surface like a countertop or in the sink. We just use our hands as much as necessary in order to get the pain tolerable. And over time, we gradually reduce how much we use our hands. After that, we move Move on to the more challenging exercises like the two shown here. With these, we only need to pick one and we may move from the one on the left to the one on the right as things get easier and improve. I would also usually recommend continuing on with the knee extension isometric shown previously as well. On the left is a standard squat. To make it more difficult, we can either add weight in our hands or we can increase how far down we go by moving on to say a lower chair. Similar Similarly, we can make it easier by either utilizing a higher chair or elevating the chair surface by say placing pillows or some other object in the chair itself. On the right is a split squat. This is significantly harder than the standard squat because it is a one leg exercise. Again, once this becomes easy, we can hold more weight in the hands to increase the difficulty. As for the number of sets and repetitions, the general recommendation is to do the knee extension isometric daily for for a total of two to three minutes. Early on, we can break that up into 10 second holds, gradually building to 30 and eventually to 60 seconds. The squat exercises we will generally perform every other day, not every single day. The reason is we want to give the tendon a day to recuperate in between, aiming for two to four sets of eight to 15 repetitions while keeping our pain below a maximum of three out of 10 
in is a good rule of thumb. Beyond these, a variety of other exercises are likely to help. This includes glute strengthening and calf strengthening exercises like shown. But getting into the details of that would take too long for this video. If you want, you can find more information on my phone app or by seeing a physical therapist. Next, let's go ahead and talk about our medication options. Unfortunately, we do not have any medication that can cure this. The role of medications here is to manage symptoms, not treat the underlying issue. Ideally, we don't use medications at all. The specific options we have are limited to NSAIDs like ibuprofen, naproxen, or drugs from another class like acetaminophen, which you probably know as Tylenol. Our preference is to use NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, but not everyone can take them. People with kidney, heart, blood pressure, or stomach bleed issues are generally recommended against it. However, there are topical, so lotion-like formulations, such as Voltaren gel, that may be safe for those people. If we do take medication, the recommendation is to use the lowest dose for the shortest possible time. We want to limit it to when our symptoms are unusually bad or when we have a special event. Say we're going to walk all day on vacation, or we have a 5K coming up and we don't want to be limited in that situation, maybe we go ahead and take an ibuprofen. But we do not take it for weeks on end when we're just at home sitting in a chair with baseline tolerable symptoms. Third, let's talk about the non-surgical medical options. Realistically, we don't have a lot here. The most well-known option is a steroid injection. However, for patellar tendinopathy, we tend not to provide one. They may be offered in some cases, but usually not because steroids weaken tendons. And remember, the the core issue in this condition is that the tendon has degenerated or essentially weakened at baseline. Weakening it more can be dangerous. The steroid may weaken the tendon enough that it sets us up for a rupture or a tear where the tendon detaches from the kneecap. That would of course be pretty bad and surgery would probably be required. Where does that leave us? We have other injections that don't have the rupture risk like regenerative medicine, which includes injections like PRP, prolotherapy, etc. The downside is these treatments are newer, so there's not a lot of evidence supporting their effectiveness, meaning you take some gamble as to whether or not they will work out. Even then, we won't utilize injections until you've tried at least a few months of consistent physical therapy. Finally, let's chat about surgical options. They do exist, but surgery is a last resort, only considered after we have undergone six Six months, if not one year or more of conservative care, meaning we have tried physical therapy, but we're not improving. In surgery, what they'll do is go in and essentially clear out the debris as well as potentially cut out part of the degenerative tendon. Depending how the tendon is cut, it may then be reattached to the kneecap using a suture or anchor. Hope is by removing poor quality tissue, the tendon can then function better and with less pain. Overall, research is mixed as to whether this surgery is effective. It doesn't appear to be terrible, but also not great. Hence why it's a last resort. Hopefully it helps out, but there is no guarantee that it will. That is generally what is going on and how we approach treating patellar tendinopathy. I hope that answered your questions and good luck with your recovery.